Thank you, John. Hi, uh, my name is Cynthia Molina. First and foremost, I am the proud mother of a 10th grader on the autism spectrum who receives special education services. And I also have the privilege of supporting multiple district advisory committees, one of which is the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education. Um, that committee at this moment is taking, undertaking very urgent work at the crossroads of disability, race, and class. A lot of it related to suspensions and the experiences that produce that. So I will take the opportunity to plug in that the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education will meet next Monday, March 8 at 5.30 p.m. And we invite you to join their ongoing work. And I also have the privilege of introducing um, the chairs of the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education. I will name them so that they know what order to come up in. And also a principal who has um, supported um, students with disabilities at her site um, in person um, during this time. So um, first, um, Ms. Kelly Bresso, followed by Patty Jurgens, and then Alan Purcell, and closing it out, Karen Gathers. If you could introduce yourself, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Kelly Bresso. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education. Um, I'm a parent of um, two kids. One is in general education and the other one is in special education at Skyline, um, Skyline High School in their community in the um, Counseling Rich program. Hi there, I'm Patty Jurgens. I'm a mom of three kids. Uh, my youngest is 17 and he, he uh, has his IEP through emotional disability and he attends a non-public school for kids with uh, emotional disability called uh, the Phillips Academy. Hi, my name is Alan Purcell. I'm the vice chair of the CAC for special education, the Oakland SOFA. And I have a nine-year-old son who's at Emerson Elementary in the Blended Inclusion Program and he has an IEP for autism and speech. Oh, sorry. That's right. Hi, my name is Karen Gathers. I'm the principal at Burkhalt Elementary School. Uh, I've been there for 13 years and we have the pre-K through fifth grade, um, three special day classes with um, students who are on the autism spectrum at Burkhalt. So we're, yes, so uh, next slide, please. Let's get started with our presentation. Great. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here and glad you're here. I'm Lisa Burnt. I'm one of the therapists at the school based program at the Center for the Vulnerable Child. I work out in the community and um, am based at the Chappelle Hayes Clinic in, at, that's on site at McClyman's High School. Very glad to be here tonight. There's two other members of the pediatric task force who are here, no, Noemi Spinazzi and Emily Frank, both doctors and other many other things in this community, teachers, mentors. And we're here to answer what questions we can and to be as um, responsive to any of the questions you have as we can be. Um, wanted to say the task force is a joint effort between the UCSF Center for Child and Community Health the Oakland Unified School District and UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals. The purpose is to provide scientific and medical information and expertise related to COVID that will support the OUSD community in reopening efforts that are equitable and safe for students, families, and workers. Next slide, please. Thanks. And our goal for, our goal is to partner with the school district families, you, students, teachers, and staff in providing accessible, trustworthy scientific information to reduce COVID transmission risk. We're independent medical providers here to offer expertise and support for better understanding the existing data and guidelines. 
This presentation addresses how to reduce your risk when schools reopen, not whether or when exactly they should reopen. So we're staying out of that conversation. We're just trying to give information and new data comes out constantly. So what may be true today can change tomorrow, but hopefully we'll be in touch. These slides were updated as of yesterday. So hot off the presses as can be, but you never know. Um, we really welcome your questions. Today, well, tonight what we'll be dealing with is we'll be covering health equity and inequities in COVID, how communities are disproportionately impacted and some of the root causes of those inequities. That's super important to all of us. We're talking about COVID transmissions and re review of how COVID is spread. We'll be talking about risk reduction and some prevention strategies, including vaccinations. And we'll be talking about these variants that we've been hearing about, what we currently know about them and what about these mutated versions of the virus. And there'll be question and answer time in between the different sections and also a time at the end. And, uh, and let's start with health equity and COVID, because that's the foundation of what uh, the value that brings us a lot of us here, how COVID-19 has highlighted deep-seated health disparities due to a long history of structural and systemic racism and ableism. Next slide, please. Thanks. When we think about this work, we use a trauma-informed sy systems approach, which basically means that we consider all these inequities as things that have been done to communities. And we ask what's been done to you instead of what's wrong with you. The values of this way of working include transparency, which is what we're doing here tonight. We're trying to show you everything we know. So there's no secrets, no um, conspiracies, even though there have been in the past and there can be suspicion of that currently. That we're trying to tell you what we know and to be in partnership with you and finding out more. Safety for everyone is a, a big priority for us. Everyone on campus, the principal, the administrative staff, the groundskeeper, the maintenance worker, the people who keep the place running and clean, the teachers, the aides, the resource specialists, the volunteers, the parents, the caregivers, and the students. Everyone on the, on the campus needs to be safe, and this is what we're talking about tonight. We look through a lens of racial equity and disability justice and how through the history that we'll talk about in a minute, there's been every kind of attempt to keep things inequitable and that we can't provide conscientious or effective services without providing an anti-racist, anti-disability, anti-anti-disability anti, anti lens. We value collaboration and empowerment, which is why we're all here. We wanna be in partnership and we wanna be valuing the expertise that you bring to this conversation, along with the medical and scientific data that you'll hear. And we wanna value and really hold up recovery and resilience in the communities. How you as caregivers, you as teachers, you as students have really embarked on this historical at a time with new resources that you may not have known you had or with old resources that the, that the bigger world didn't know that you had and the resilience that you've shown, the, the way that people in, have had to work to reinvent education and to reinvent work life and to reinvent community life in this time where everything is so new. This painting here is by Kadir Nelson. It's called After the Storm. He created this painting at the beginning of the pandemic to remind us of connection and closeness that so many of us are longing for. And if you notice, everyone is looking at this in the same direction and the light kind of graces their faces. So we're just inviting you to consider how so many of us have this shared vision of safety and a safe return to the school buildings for students and workers and families. And as we all are here together, close in whatever way we can be to let that light grace us as it does the people in the painting. There may be different values in how to get there. And we've covered some of those. Next slide, please. In dealing with health equity, ableism, racism, medical abuse, just to name these things, it's important to name them before we can 
work against them before we can really heal some of these systems that have kept communities outside of access. There's been a justifiable mistrust of healthcare systems and medical systems from historical and ongoing experiences of discrimination, abuse, and harm. People with disabilities are discriminated against historically and in the current day, and they may have less access to information and have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Poverty, educational gaps, housing instability, houselessness, and a lack of health care put racial and ethnic minority groups, so-called minorities, in higher COVID risk, at higher COVID risk. And some of the strategies that have been proposed to slow COVID spread have actually harmed and impacted communities unintentionally due to impacts such as lost wages, increased stress, and other consequences, as we know so many people who've had to put themselves in unsafe situation in order to support their families or in order to keep this society going. Next slide, please. Yeah, and here we see where we live. This is our home. And communities and neighborhoods in Oakland have been affected very differently by COVID as we've dealt with the socioeconomic inequalities. COVID infection rates are notably higher in po poorer communities with um, high poverty than in more affluent areas. We want to acknowledge that this pandemic is both stressful and is compound, that stress is compounded by the inequalities and racism and ableism that people are, have already been suffering. In Alameda County, while case rates continue to fall from their January peak among all racial and ethnic groups, Latinx people are still more than four times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 than white people. And Black or African-American residents are nearly two times more likely to die from COVID-19 compared to their white neighbors. As we think about addressing these disparities, we have a real opportunity in the scientific and medical community to demonstrate our trustworthiness to communicate as a system that we care about and value the health of every single person. We recognize there's a special consideration here tonight for us all. Because for families with kids with special educational needs, the discussion of in-person learning has been really complicated. On the one hand, some students with special education needs also have complex medical needs that may increase the chance of serious illness due to COVID-19. On the other, for children with special education needs, school is also a place where they receive fundamental educational supports and therapies. We recognize this complexity and these individual considerations and we hope to share helpful and scientifically accurate information with you tonight. Next slide, please. I think I keep forgetting to ask, thank you. Um, we wanna talk about the mental health impact for a little bit and of course the di disproportionate impact on students with disabilities, black and Latinx students, low income students, English learners, unhoused and LGBTQ families and youth. They face greater mental health challenges. For all of us in this period, there's been grief and loss, not just due to losing loved ones to the disease, but also loss of what's familiar to us. Oops, hang on a second. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Here we go. It says in here, one in three high school students report feeling chronically sad and hopeless. And we know that they're not alone. I would think grownups feel this way too. There's a grief of what's familiar of the way we used to be together. So there's a feeling of isolation for many of us. Over half of LGBT students report feeling chronically sad and hopeless. Again, people, this is permeated for all of us. There are so many people sharing limited space at home too that some relationships can get kind of ragged. I know I'm on my last nerve with people I love very much. So that, that can undermine things that usually have a flexibility to them that kind of hold us. Um, and there's also a lack of access to healthcare, childcare, employment, and distance learning tools. Those are not equal. Uh, those access to those things are not equal. And the expectation somehow that they are and that everybody should just deal with it adds to the stress. So there's some ways to address some of these, many of which you I'm sure have been practicing already. 
but just as a matter of, you know, I'd be interested too in, in what ideas you have, but for just the basics here, what we talked about with the grief and the loss, we can recognize emotions, we can name them, give room for people to cry, give room for people to get to the layer underneath the crabbiness, um, spending time together quietly, using visuals and emojis, pictures, movies, music, art to discuss em emotions and being kind of transparent about our own emotions that we don't know exactly what's going on. All at the same time, we wanted to reassure that we're doing the best we can and we're okay as a family. We wanna teach tools for emotional regulation, tools like mindfulness, like breathing, like what does it take when I'm, when I'm about to pop off what do I actually find? Do I need to say a little prayer? Do I need to squish a squishy ball? What do I need to do? Do I need to go scribble on something? Do I need some quiet time? Which we can be models for how we take care of ourselves at this time. Relationships at this time are a huge protective factor. Again and again, the research shows that if a child has somebody in their life that knows who they are and how special they are, it makes a huge difference. So encouraging them to connect with their friends as much as they can and to connect with you one-on-one -on -one or with some other grown-ups, If you can find some playtime with, with your young ones, that would be wonderful. Video calls to family members, letter writing even to family members can be a way to make different kinds of connections than you've even had before. In a way, this can be an opportunity for everybody to gear down and connect in a different way. I think it'll be really interesting to see what, what has come out of this that's positive for us all. Structure and routine is another protective factor. You know, keeping, keeping bedtimes the same and wake up times the same and showing up with school dressed and making a clear schedule for the day, maybe a chore list. It really helps our little brains to, to have that sense of accomplishment. Even if it's a little something somebody can check off that really helps with the depression and the sense of lostness. Have a dedicated time for home, homework or other creative activities. And if you can, eat together at least once a day would be wonderful. Some sort of exercise is another protective factor, be it some kind of movement, you know, just wiggling around to music. If you can go outside, that'd be great. If you can make it to a park, that would be terrific. I know there's a lot to consider there inequities wise, like where is it safe to go? And what do we mean by safe? And who's safe and who's not? really important considerations. And if there's a way to keep the blood flowing and the endorphins pumping, it's a really good protective factor. Dancing together can just be the goofiest thing and help when things get really heavy. And um, chair exercises, there's a lot on YouTube right now. I'm sure you, I mean, you, have, you have solutions to these that we haven't begun to think of. Um, connection to something bigger is also something that there's, it's sort of funny, like, our grandmothers all knew this, but research is showing more and more in happiness research that the worst kind of trauma and suffering can be transcended if it's seen as serving a better purpose, that this is something we're all going through together and it will teach us something about ourselves that we can pass on to our own children and grandchildren. So connecting to nature, to spirituality, to each other and your commitment to justice that I've been hearing this evening, just some, you know, what is it that your children value and that you as a family. What's kind of the mission statement of our family? I've heard people say that sometime. Next slide, please. So this brings us to um, the words of Dr. Nunez Smith, who talks about the unfortunate misinformation and disinformation that's out there and how fast it travels and how easy it is to get caught up in it. And some of it is um, well-intentioned and some of it's not so. Some of it is intended to keep communities down. So she says, I'm hoping as part of the new normal that we really restore trust in science and, and evidence and data. So that's what we're here tonight, coming humbly, wanting to earn your trust and deserve your trust this evening and presenting some of the information that we have up to this point. So I'd like to hand it off to John for Q&A. Thank you very much, Lisa. Appreciate that. And let's just, uh, I do want to address uh, one question that was answered in the Q&A already. Uh, and that is, will it be optional to send our children to school? Uh, this spring, yes. Uh, no matter what uh, is going on, whether the schools are open, uh, you are going to have the right to keep your student at home. 
uh, in distance learning for the rest of the spring. So that is something that will continue. Um, I, Lisa, if you can, if you can tell families really what kinds of things that they should look out for, what what are the signs of emotional distress? Uh, how do they manifest themselves, and, and how is it different from you know a kindergartner versus a twelfth grader? How how does it vary between the grades? Well, that's a great question. Um, everybody's so individual, but I would say. You know, if, if somebody's well, obviously crying more, I think sleep is a really good indicator and bedtime can be super important, especially for the younger ones. Um, I'm, you know, people are having dreams and people are needing to know at all hours of the night that they're safe. So paying attention to bedtime routines and waking up routines and for the older ones who may be finding that we already know even before anybody had, shel had to shelter in place that our teens were staying up all night playing games or watching videos. And, and just to, if, if they get more and more and more withdrawn, then that's, that's troubling. Really, really, if there's an opportunity to talk and they, you just can't talk, like if they just are so withdrawn that it just seems hopeless, then it may be time to call in, call us or try to have them. Sometimes they need somebody outside the home to talk to. So you're welcome to do that with depression for for young ones looks a lot like irritability. It doesn't look sad necessarily. It just looks like snappy or just like, and who isn't right now, but yeah, maybe I'm giving too much away about myself, but yeah, I think that irritability is, is something, if it's out of hand, you just need to, they may just need somebody to talk to or draw with or play with. Um, that's what I know for middle school, later elementary and middle school, the, the, the loss of the socializing is so acute that if they've, have friends and they're not contacting their friends, pay attention to that. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Spinozzi, do you want to take it from here? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing this incredibly important information. Um, in kids who um, cannot quite talk and uh, cannot quite express themselves, uh, sometimes a change in behavior, uh, I would add, might be a sign that the child is in distress uh, and might need some more emotional support. And then I agree completely with Lisa, any change in sleep or eating habits or playing habits uh, would be uh, thoughts that uh, maybe a child with special needs who can't quite tell us what is going on in their heart is, is struggling. Uh, my name is Noemi Spinazzi. I am a pediatrician at Children's Hospital Oakland. I have been a member of this community for a decade. I am the medical director of the Down Syndrome Clinic. Most of my patients have some sort of educational need or developmental difference. And uh, I come to you today to talk about uh, how COVID is transmitted and how to decrease our risk of transmitting COVID uh, in the school setting. Next slide, please. So first, we need to define what a high risk exposure is because we will be talking about this kind of term throughout the presentation. What's considered a high risk exposure is close, so within six feet, person to person contact for more than 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, if someone says, ooh, I, I did, have you had a high risk exposure to someone who is infected with COVID, what they are asking is, were you person to person contact within six feet of them for more than 15 minutes? Just passing someone on the street, for example, does not count as a high risk exposure. Next slide, please. The other important con concept is for someone who is not infected to become infected, particles from the infected person must make contact with the healthy person's nose, mouth, or, ear, or eyes, okay? Particles leave our body when we cough, breathe, sneeze, laugh, or do anything that, that uh, kind of implies a breathing out. Next slide, please. So how is COVID transmitted? So infected particles leaving the, the infected person 
are most frequently uh, cause infection in the form of droplets. Droplets are larger particles. These tend to fall within a few feet of us. Uh, so droplet transmission is the most frequent form of transmission. Less commonly, much smaller particles called aerosols that can stay in the air for longer are a way that we can transmit COVID. Also less commonly, COVID can be transmitted from surfaces. So infected particles land on a surface and then someone who is not infected touches that surface and then touches their eyes, nose or mouth. Next slide, please. So again, to review it a different way, for a respiratory transmission to occur, Particles, viral particles, leave the body of the infected person. They have to survive through the air, and then they have to come in contact with the eyes, nose, and mouth of someone who is not infected. Next slide, please. So when we understand this, then we can think about ways of protecting against respiratory transmission by keeping the infected particles within the infected person, by having good skin symptom screening, masking, small groups, testing, decreasing how long these particles live in the air by increasing our physical distancing, being outdoors, better air ventilation, and then keeping those particles away from the person who does not have COVID, again, with masks and other barriers, as well as vaccine. Next slide, please. And when we think about reducing risk, especially in the setting of a classroom, next slide, please. What we think about is layers of defense. And what we use is what's called the Swiss cheese model. Swiss cheese has holes. And each slice of Swiss cheese has some holes. And so if one single slice of Swiss cheese is our only defense, it's going to have holes and we're not it's not going to be a very good defense but if we put several layers of swiss cheese one in front of the other then the holes are going to be plugged up and that's going to be a lot safer as you can see here in the picture so multiple layers of defense improve our success no one layer is perfect next slide what i want to call out is that some of these slices may be more challenging for a person with special needs. And we're gonna go through each of these slices today. And what we're going to encourage you to do is if one of these slices seems difficult when you think about your student, when you think about your child, you should partner with your doctor and your school team to think about how to make that slice more successful and to also think about how to make other slices even more successful to make up for one that might not work as well. So let's go through these slices. Next slide. Number one, super important. Sc stay home if you are sick. So this means not leaving the house if you have new symptoms. Some children have chronic medical illnesses and have chronic symptoms that are the same every day. We are not talking about those chronic symptoms. We're talking about new symptoms that have appeared within the previous 24 hours. And we're not just talking about the kids. If anybody in the family unit has new symptoms, then the child should stay home. Some people are getting COVID tests for routine reasons, like before surgery or before travel. Other people are getting COVID tests because they have symptoms. If anybody in the family is waiting for a COVID result, the kid should not come to school. And if someone is aware of the fact that they have had a high risk exposure within six feet for more than 15 minutes with someone who has tested positive for COVID, they also should not come to school. We think of symptoms of COVID as the ones listed on the right, fever, cough, shortness of breath, muscle pain, headaches, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, 
But also in children, there can be some more subtle symptoms, the kind of symptoms that we are used to seeing more often, like runny nose or a little vomiting or, or a little diarrhea. Even if you think you know what is causing those symptoms, because they are new symptoms, the child should stay home. And you should contact your doctor or healthcare provider to make a plan. Next slide, please. The second slice is physical distancing. So ideally, we would stay six feet apart. Most big viral particles fall within three feet. So the idea is ideally six feet, definitely three feet apart because most particles fall within that distance. They will go much further if we're coughing, laughing, yelling, screaming. So if it's an activity that involves those things, then we're going to really maximize the distance. This is where I want to call out that distancing may be more difficult for students who have some mobility needs, some uh, sensory impairment needs, who need diaper changes, who have behavioral needs that require more close supervision. What are we going to do to still make this slice work? Well, we can be close when we need to and physically distance when we don't. For kids who are a little more impulsive and forget that they need to stay distanced, we can use visuals and repetition to help with behavior. If what, this slice is just not doable, then we maximize the other layers of protection. Next slide, please. Masks are really important. There are different types of masks. There are cloth masks that are reusable and can be purchased in any store or can be made at home. We recommend using at least two layers for extra protection because the holes in a cloth mask are bigger. Surgical masks are more tightly woven and so they offer better protection. They can be layered over a cloth mask. There are specialized masks called N95 that are more specialized and offer better protection. They, are, they work well if they are fitted to the person, otherwise they are not as useful. They're most appropriate for prolonged close exposure. So for example, if we are working around the child who absolutely cannot tolerate a mask, then those around them might choose to wear an N95 to protect themselves further. To the right, I am showing you a mask that has a valve. These are dangerous because they still allow our own particles to escape through the valve. So they are okay for wildfires, but they are not okay to prevent the spread of particles in the setting of a pandemic. Next slide, please. And I want to recognize that not all students have an easy time wearing a mask. I am a firm believer in the fact that children can learn and that just because a kid won't wear a mask, it doesn't mean they can't because I believe that kids with special needs can learn and some kids need more support to learn. So if you know that your child or student has a hard time wearing a mask, you should work with your school team to think about ways that a child can get used to a mask, maybe with desensitization or rewards, maybe some mask breaks that are scheduled that give the child relief. Can the child tolerate a different type of cloth barrier? While this will not get everybody to tolerate a mask, I think that this approach of believing that children can learn will make the number of children that truly cannot wear a mask a much smaller number. If there is a child who truly cannot wear a mask, like with everything else, we think about maximizing other layers of protection. Next slide, please. Physical barriers for the face are another layer of protection. So we're talking about face shields. Face shields will block particles from getting to your face. They also make it harder for us to touch our eyes, nose and mouth, which is how we get particles from a surface onto our eyes, nose and mouth. So they can be a helpful added layer of protection. 
It is really important to know that a face shield is not a substitute for wearing a mask. So the expectation is that someone will wear a mask and if needed, also a face shield. Next slide, please. Another layer of protection is washing our hands, especially before touching our face. And considering how many times a day we touch our face without recognizing that we're doing it, we're talking about hand hygiene often. We're talking about hand sanitizer, which is very effective, and also washing our hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, you can sing a song, before and after eating, after using the bathroom, and if our hands are visibly dirty. I, we will need to teach and practice hand washing and add hygiene to classroom routines. The idea of these deep cleanings are actually less useful because how often can you possibly deep clean a space to truly disinfect every surface? Although we do expect more frequent cleanings in a special education classroom. The real key is, is really having really good hand hygiene. Next slide, please. Minimizing time in crowded spaces. So staggered approaches with staggered departures, staggered arrival from schools, staggered class times and lunch and bathroom breaks so that we're not crowding the hallways. Next slide, please. Testing and contact tracing is another important layer of protection. COVID tests can be done in different ways through nose swabs and cheek swabs and deeper nose swabs. And they're done for different reasons. Sometimes they're done because we have new symptoms. So I have new symptoms and I need to know if I have COVID and so I get a test and the test tells me if I have COVID or not. Sometimes it's done after an exposure. So I don't have any symptoms, but I had a high risk exposure to someone who has tested positive for COVID. So I get tested to know if I too have COVID now, because not everybody who has COVID has symptoms. And so sometimes we need to get a test, even if we don't have symptoms, if we know we've had a high risk exposure with someone who does. There's a third type of testing called monitoring that has been done in some situations to sort of understand, hey, no symptoms, no exposures, but how are we doing? What are the rates of test of COVID in the community. Monitoring type tests, testings are also done usually by public health department or research studies or other organized type uh, situations. Next slide, please. This is an important one, maximizing ventilation. So what we said is that Viral particles leave our bodies as we talk, sing, cough, and then the bigger ones fall, usually within three feet, most of them within six feet, and then some of the smaller ones can linger in the air. So how do we clean the air? Well, we can clean it with air disinfectants, basically. So systems like air cleaners, air purifiers, um, and there's different types of them. The other option is we exchange the air. So by opening windows and having fans, opening doors, so that if there are little particles in the air, we are exchanging them for clean air. In a classroom where there's difficulties with wearing masks uh, or other slices, we are going to be thinking about maximizing ventilation because we're always gonna be thinking about making one slice bigger if other slices are more difficult to um, apply. Next slide, please. I hit you with a lot of information. And so before we move on to a discussion around COVID vaccines and variants, I want to stop and turn it over to John for questions. Thank you, doctor. Um... If uh, you can take a look at the Q&A, there are a couple of questions in Spanish that I uh, can't read, uh, but I'll start with this one. Next fall, will all these slices be necessary if most of the population is vaccinated? 
Great question. And Dr. Frank will address this in the next section. And until we get to enough of us being vaccinated, we will still be having multiple layers of protection in place because the vaccine is just another slice of Swiss cheese that has holes. Very good. In the meantime, um, a number of our SPED students come to school on first student, the, the buses. Yes. Uh, so your concerns about the buses and, and how we should approach that. Yes. So here are my thoughts about buses. First of all, we need to think about any new symptoms or exposures or anybody in the family waiting for a COVID test before we even leave our door in the house, right? So if I, if the kid has symptoms, anybody in the family has new symptoms, or we know that we have been exposed, we should play it safe and not go to school. And that means not get on the bus. So we need to think about what that implies for communication, et cetera. Once on the bus, we need to maximize ventilation on the bus. This might mean improving ventilation by opening windows and any other system that can help clean and exchange the air. And then if the same bus is being used for multiple trips, we need to think about how to, uh, 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 first of all, assign seats and uh, distance between uh, students on the bus. And then uh, think about how to clean those surfaces uh, between rides. It, I think of the bus as similarly to um, our clinic rooms in, in, in the clinic, right, where I see patients. We are seeing more than one patient in the same room, but because we're using that same room for more than one patient, we clean between use and uh, uh, we give it a few minutes, uh, which will be, you know, the ride to pick up the next students uh, to maximize safety. And then we should expect kids to be wearing the mask on the bus as well. Um, so again, layers, layers, layers. Great, thank you very much. Um, one, one question asked, uh, are ventilation improvements being done currently in OUSD schools? I can say that yes, they are being done. Uh, we've uh, added <clears throat> new MERV 16 filters to a lot of our uh, forced air systems. Uh, we are doing everything we can with regard to opening windows at schools. And if the windows are painted shut, our staff is working to uh, get those open so that they can be opened on a regular basis uh, when need be. Um, we do have some classrooms that don't have windows. And so in, in any case, when we don't have forced, um, forced air or uh, open windows, we're putting actual uh, air filters, uh, the, the kind of portable air filters into those classrooms as well. So uh, these are things that we're very much focused on uh, regarding uh, ventilation in our schools. John, if I could just, just add briefly on that point that yes. there are um, almost 3,000 HEPA filters have been ordered and most are in schools right now uh, in terms of getting to the right level of air exchanges that are described in the uh, uh, safety standards. Okay, great. Um, here's another question. The students are going back to school. The, the plan is to open schools to some in-person learning at some point this spring. Uh, we do not have a date when that's going to happen, uh, but we do have some hubs operating, as you all know, probably by now, uh, and we're expanding our hubs. Uh, and then uh, we are we are working towards an opening of TK to five, starting with TK to two sometime this spring, um, but we don't have uh, a determination yet when that's going to happen. Um, is there another question in here that you saw that you might be able to answer there, doctor? Well, the uh, um I think that there's there's a couple of questions about how different students have different needs, and uh, we that is one thing that I want to acknowledge. Right, this is a, a presentation for students with special education needs and and IEPs, but that is such a diverse community, and uh, each child is very different. And uh, um, what I want to say is that what we are presenting today is, is not specific to one population, to one type of ability or developmental difference. Uh, this is these are the layers of protection that have been shown to work as districts around the country have reopened in ways where even though there was a lot of COVID going around in the community, 
because the schools were putting these types of layers in place, there was almost zero transmission in school. That is very important. So we know, we have proof that these layers work to keep our students, our staff, our teachers, everybody in the schools safe. What we are trying to do today is we are trying to think about how could someone's developmental difference or different ability impact our ability to make each slice successful. And we are giving some suggestions. The truth is just like we have individualized educational plans, each person is different. And so if you think of an individual need for your child or for your student, my advice is to partner with your school team and partner with your doctor on troubleshooting and thinking about how to make each of these slices successful. So that is all I wanted to acknowledge that there are there were some questions around how not everybody with an IEP is the same. And what I wanted to call out is I know. And I think that the layers that work are the same and how we make them successful is the part that looks a little different depending on the individual needs of the child. Great, thank you, doctor. All right, uh, how about we move on to vaccines now? Uh, Dr. Frank, is that uh, gonna be you? That's me, next slide. Please. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is um, Dr. Emily Frank. I am a pediatrician at UCSF and Children's Hospital Oakland. I am also a health teacher at Life Academy in Oakland, and I am excited to talk to you about my favorite topic, which is science. Um, I'm going to be talking about the vaccine, and I'm going to be talking about the variants. So um, another slice of this Swiss cheese model is the COVID-19 vaccine. And so I wanna start by reminding us um, how a vaccine works. A vaccine is sort of like a lesson for the defense system in our bodies. So it teaches our body what it needs um, to know to recognize a germ before we ever see it in real life. It's almost as if I showed you a picture of someone famous so that if then you were walking along the street and you saw that famous person, you would recognize them. It's the same idea. And so the way that the COVID vaccine works is it contains a set of instructions like a recipe that instructs our body how to make one piece of the virus. Um, one protein called the spike protein that's on the outside of the virus. And so our body learns to recognize that spike protein so that if it ever sees it again, it attacks it. It takes our bodies, our immune systems time to learn that lesson. And the more, um, excuse me, the body can learn more about that germ generally if it gets that lesson more than once. And that's why several of the vaccines require two doses. I want to acknowledge there are lots of questions about the vaccine and every one of these questions is a valid question. Next slide, please. One of the biggest questions on folks' minds is, is this vaccine effective? Does it work? And I am very excited to tell you that the answer is yes. So far, five vaccines have been developed and all five vaccines are very effective. Two vaccines um, have been available in the United States, the Pfizer, and the Moderna vaccines. And over this weekend, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was um, uh, approved and uh, production is ramping up right now. So when I say effective, what do I mean? What I mean is that all five of these vaccines significantly reduce the risk of disease and really decrease the risk of hospitalization, 
meaning severe disease, and death. What we're seeing is that in places that have higher vaccination rates, vaccination rates of over 30%, we are seeing the new rates of infection decline rapidly, which is really exciting. Next slide, please. So another really important question at the forefront of our minds is if this vaccine is safe. And again, I am excited to tell you, yes. So um, even though um, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine use a new kind of technology called mRNA, we've been doing years and years of research on this type of technology, decades. And so while this is the first that we're using them in a vaccine, we're very, um, we've studied a lot what mRNA can do and how it works. Understandably, there's a lot of hesitancy related to how quickly this vaccine was developed. Even though it was developed quickly, it still had to go through the same regulatory standards and approval processes as other vaccines. The speed at which it was developed was thanks to so many scientists and researchers all focusing on finding a solution, um, like unifying and trying to do that. Um, the vaccine has been studied um, in, um, all of them have been studied in adults of all ethnicities. The Pfizer vaccine has also been studied um, in young people ages 16 to 18. The other two vaccines just in folks 18 and older. And I'll talk a bit more about kids and vaccines in a moment. The vaccine can cause side effects. And most of these side effects are pretty minor. Things such as a sore arm or some swollen lymph nodes, maybe a fever and chills or a headache, fatigue or muscle aches or some nausea. These side effects are generally quite short lived and it's a sign that your body's doing what it's supposed to. It's learning how to recognize that spike protein so that it can mount a stronger response to fight it off in the future. Severe allergic reactions are quite rare with this vaccine. And thankfully, um, the vast majority of those allergic reactions occur in the first 15 minutes after getting it. At many sites, they are monitoring people for those 15 minutes so that if a person were to have a severe allergic reaction, they would um, be in the presence of, um, uh, of others who could help them get further care quickly if they needed it. Can the vaccine cause COVID-19? No. All we're doing is with a vaccine is giving the body the recipe to make a tiny piece of the protein, this little outer decoration, if you will, of the virus. We're not putting COVID virus into people with a vaccine. And so you cannot get COVID-19 from taking the vaccine. Next slide, please. Other important things to know about the vaccines, your questions and your concerns are important and I definitely encourage you to talk with your medical team. Um, for um, any family members of students who may be pregnant or breastfeeding, um, uh, we're still gathering data on this, but I encourage you to talk to your doctor and so far it seems quite safe. If um, someone in the family takes medications that suppress the immune system or has a history of um, serious allergic reaction um, to foods or medicines or vaccines, check in with your doctor. The only um, uh, major medical reason not to get the COVID vaccine is if you have an anaphylactic anaphylactic reaction to the first dose of the vaccine, meaning a very 
serious allergic reaction um, as opposed to the minor symptoms that we talked about. Vaccination is very much a personal choice. And I wanna recognize there's a lot of factors that people need to consider as they're thinking about um, vaccination for themselves and their families. Um, and a healthcare provider um, that you trust can help think through these things with you to make an informed decision. I wanna um, share that initially, I was quite nervous about getting the vaccine. I was nervous at how quickly it had been developed um, and how expedited the process felt. And I was fortunate to have an opportunity to look at the data and look at the studies and see that they had gone through um, those um, regulatory steps. Um, and um, I got my first vaccination. I had a very sore right arm and that was it. With my second vaccination, I felt kind of crummy the next day. I had a headache and chills and nausea and it was gone by the day after that. But um, for each of us, vaccination um, is, is a personal choice. And please you know, talk to the folks that you trust to figure out what makes sense for you and your loved ones. Next slide, please. Um, can kids get the vaccine? Not yet. So the Pfizer vaccine um, was tested on young people ages 16 to 18. Um, they are uh, not, not in, in terms of how the, the vaccine um, appointment slots are being open, um, children 16 and over are not yet getting vaccinated. There are several um, trials, several studies going on right now to make sure that the vaccine is safe in children and that it's effective in children. But the good news is that when the community gets vaccinated, when the adults get vaccinated, the risk of catching COVID is lower for kids too, even if they haven't yet received the vaccine. Um, I wanted to bring to your attention that family members of children with some disabilities are eligible for early vaccination. And there's more information about this on the County Public Health website. And it's something you can check in with your doctor about. Next slide, please. These vaccines are incredible, um, especially in terms of preventing death and hospitalization. And even so, these vaccines are just one slice of prevention. We really do need multiple layers to keep everybody in the community as safe as possible. Next slide, please. So a few words on variants. Next slide, please. So first off, what is a variant? So viruses replicate very quickly and very frequently. And as this happens, um, they make mistakes. They're kind of sloppy. It's like if you were copying a sentence over and over and over again, a hundred times, you might miss a letter or you might miss a word. And that's what's happening with um, viruses when they replicate. And so when you have a slightly different version, a letter or a word is changed, we call it a variant. And over time, those changes that help the virus either spread more effectively or um, enter the body more effectively, those are the ones that tend to keep replicating. And so over time, the structure of a virus can evolve, it can change. Next slide, please. And so you may have heard in the news about several new variants. Um, there is a Brazilian variant, a South African one, a California one, um, and a UK one. And there's a lot of um, headlines um, circulating about these variants. Variant, remember, just means change. And so a variant can potentially cause all kinds of changes. It, it could make something more contagious. It could make 
um, more serious illness occur. It could, you know, in theory, make um, something less responsive to vaccines or, or, or cause less antibodies to be produced. But the really good news is that all these layers of um, harm reduction that we've talked about, wearing a mask, spacing when possible, um, maximizing ventilation, avoiding crowded spaces, all of these strategies are going to be helpful um, in reducing spread of variants, just as they're helpful in terms of reducing the spread of the original virus. Um, as we've said many times tonight, every layer has holes, and that's why we use every layer, uh, or as many layers as reasonably possible. And so someone asked the question, once the majority of people are vaccinated, do we still need these layers? We're a long ways away from the majority of folks being vaccinated. And so for the time being, even if there's a high proportion of vaccinated people in the classroom, it's still really important to use these layers to minimize any transmission that's at risk of occurring. Um, next slide, please. That was a lot of information. And so um, we are going to pause for questions. Thank you, Dr. Frank. I wanted to bring into the discussion uh, Kelly Jeanette, and uh, school nurse and uh, children's hospital nurse, and Karen Gathers, our principal at Burkhalter. So if you guys want to just join the discussion with any, any perspective that you want to bring from what you have seen on the ground in your school, in your, uh, in your venues uh, that would, would add to this discussion, that'd be really great. Sure, this is Kelly, a school nurse at Burbank Preschool in the Diagnostic Center. Um, what I've seen at our site is that um, whenever anybody enters the building, we have a scanner code and we scan it on our phone. We answer the questions um, and that's our self-screening every day. We sign in, we wash our hands, have our mask on and we physical distance from anybody in our office. We have the HEPA filter on, the windows open, and there's a limited amount of staff in classrooms. I've seen um, children that are being tested for IEPs, their initial assessments, and if po and these are small children. So if possible, there's a um, plastic barrier in between the testers and the children. They can't wear masks because they're small. And the staff testing them is all prepared with PPE, masks. They have the face shields, um, hand sanitizer, and they do the best they can. Not all children can be contained behind the plastic barrier. So they run around the room, the toys get washed after they're done assessing, and everybody is pretty good with the PPE. The training has been excellent and it's ongoing all the time. And they also, when they call to remind families about appointments, they check, you know, they go through the health screening questions. Has your child been ill? Anybody in the family ill? And it's going to be the same way when children are back in session. Mm -hmm. And this is Karen Gathers from Barkhalter. And in addition to everything that um, Kelly Jeanette just said, uh, we actually had a learning hub um, at the school for our special needs students. And we went through the protocol when they arrived of having every single person, including the kids, um, use the hand sanitizer. Most of the students were not masked, but as she said, the adults were with both um, PPE in terms of screens and also masks. Um, once students um, uh, left, uh, or before they left, they also used um, hand sanitizer. Someone asked in the chat about whether in restrooms and things there would be hot water. Um, at least at Burkhalter, we do have access and the students will have access to hot water to wash their hands in addition to using the um, hand sanitizer that's provided, not just in the restrooms, but also in the classroom. Um, in addition, the classrooms and all of the big spaces where students might be 
have not one but two air purifiers and uh, with the HEPA filters that have been updated. And um, I'm lucky enough to have a, a washing machine and dryer on site for any large messes that might occur because um, we have little ones. We have um, four and five year olds there as well. Um, a lot of the training for staff has gone on and continues to go on. They, we all go through a um, protocol as well where we're checking our own symptoms. We have daily um, sheets that we need to fill out. So the messaging is going to the adults as well that if they are not feeling well or if they're uh, developing symptoms, as the doctor said, within a 24 hour period that they should also get checked. So it's a pretty good um, protocol. Custodial services has um, been trained and retrained on how to effectively clean and sanitize, not just the flat surfaces, but also place structures and such every single day um, that students and our adults are on staff. So um, I think everybody's really well trained. Um, the expectation is, as the doctor said, we'll try to help students um, wear masks, we'll incentivize it, but if they do not, um, have the capacity to be able to do that, all of the adults will certainly take as many precautions as we can. Great, thank you very much, both of you. Um, all right, so here's some questions regarding the virus, okay. vaccines, et cetera. John, uh, sorry, yes. John, sorry. I, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Principal Gathers, what has it been like that experience uh, with all of these protections in place? Did you have a lot of cases of COVID? What what what, what actually happened? Because that was real life scenario with kids with more significant needs. What happened? Well, um, we had our hub from about two weeks before the Thanksgiving break till the end of January with the winter recess um, thrown in. And we actually had three positive cases during that time. They were all adult cases of people who were working. Um, so it is possible, even with all of the precautions and the PPE, that you're going to get um, positive outbreaks. We were tested um, almost weekly, um, or at least once during every seven to 10 day period on site. Um, and I think that probably prevented more outbreaks because we found out the information quickly. Um, we didn't have any um, that were brought to my attention as the principal positive cases among students though, it was just the adults. So even though the adults had positives you, with the layers in place, there, we, we were able to contain the spread. That is huge. Thank you for sharing that because that seems like a real life scenario. Yes. And I'd love to add um, something onto that. It relates to one of the questions in the chat about, you know, what about the youngest children? They're not going to be protected. And um, so, so a couple comments. So right now the trials are going um, on for children as young as six. We wanna make sure that the younger children are safe with this vaccine and it's working in them before younger children get tested. But the really good news about this is that um, children under 10 are not very good at spreading COVID. They're only about one third as likely to transmit um, COVID um, to each other or to adults as adults are to them. And so what's great is as we're sort of vaccinating from the eldest folks down to the younger folks, um, uh, that works really nicely with the existing biology and the fact that um, kids who are younger, especially younger than 10, are really just not as good. Unlike most other um, viruses, kids just aren't very good at transmitting this one. And there's different theories about why that is, but we're seeing it again and again in the data. Um, of course, a question that came up in my mind uh, with regard to Burkhalter is, uh, was there any indication, do either of you know, or does Ms. Gathers know, uh, was there any indication that the three positive tests were related to each other? Good question. Um, we had, um, without even consciously thinking about it, had a situation where the students were all um, placed in the same classroom each day. 
At the end of the day, however, we would meet collectively in our auditorium and then we would dismiss the kids from there. And we quickly learned, uh-oh, that just wasn't very smart of us to do. So after the first positive case, we did not do that. And um, the, the last case actually, we got notified during the learning hub, but I don't know that it was because or as a result of being in contact with anybody in the hub. So, it, you know, sometimes it's just lessons learned. We learned that one really quickly. And um, between the first positive case and the second positive case, we had probably four, four, four full weeks, but there were breaks in between. So we're not sure if it happened, you know, as a result of coming in contact with folks over the winter recess or what. Just couldn't. So, so no indication as no. right now that there was any connection between the cases. Okay. No. Good. Good. Well, that and yep. that. Go ahead, doctor. Just what I want to call out is what Principal Gathers just said that is so important, which is this idea of cohorting, having a stable group, right? And so if we learn of, of a positive, okay, and we know that that positive has only been in contact with, this, with the same specific group without a lot of intermingling, then we can do contact tracing, that type of testing that I was talking about earlier, where, you know, public health becomes involved and we test the people who had a high risk exposure, 15 minutes, uh, six feet, uh, less than six feet, and then we can contain it, right? And so that is another really important piece uh, of being successful and uh, uh, really thinking hard about what is necessary you know, stable classrooms, et cetera, and what and 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 what is what should be avoided, like the gathering together and and intermingling of groups. Um, so the importance of what's called a stable cohort should probably be its own slice um, in in talking about risk reduction and something that we need to think about um, quite hard as we as we do the nitty gritty planning um, and. Uh, um, what I, what I know is that whenever there is a positive case, public health becomes involved and there's that process of contact tracing. And so um, then, you know, the students are notified and the, and the students' families are notified and then there's testing of the students. So um, what, what I am hearing here is that with the with the right type of caution in terms of testing and cohorting and layers of protection, there were months of school at the height of our pandemic. Let's remember Thanksgiving to January was when we had the most cases and the total of three adult only cases in, in that scenario is, is really impressive. And I just, from a doctor's perspective, cause I, I'm learning about it now as uh, principal gathers is sharing it is really impressive. Um, I'm gonna ask the question myself, John, because I see it over and over in the chat. If someone has had COVID already, should they get vaccinated? The answer is yes. Um, and uh, uh, the recommendation is to still get vaccinated. The other question I've seen over and over in the chat is if I get the vaccine, can I still spread COVID? We don't know the answer to that question. So I got the vaccine. And uh, I come, in, I have a high risk exposure with someone who has COVID. The vaccine protects me from getting sick, being hospitalized and dying from COVID. That we know. We don't know for sure because it was not studied whether the vaccine also protects me from maybe getting a, a, a no symptom form of COVID and passing it to someone else. We don't know that yet, we are studying it, but that is why we are continuing to repeat that we have to have layers of protection because if I have a mask on, if I'm washing my hands, if I'm still keeping my distance, then we're still keeping each other safe. Great. Um, there is a question that we wanted to ask uh, Ms. Gathers. Um, can you really speak to the parent perspective that you saw uh, through the hubs? What, you know, were, were the students' needs met? Um, how did parents react to it? What, what, what did they think of the whole experience for their students? Well, the, the, we were so um, encouraged um, because uh, the first couple of days we didn't have a lot of students who were coming. 
And then um, we did a series of phone calling and let them know what protocols and such we had put in place. And um, at the height of it, we had about 60%, 70% of the students who had been identified as um, wanting to come, actually coming. They enjoyed it. So um, it was just a short amount of time, but even that time um, in terms of the parent perspective was great. They saw their um, children um, learning. Um, they knew that we were trying to also um, make sure that they um, got outside to play and, and were on a uh, play structure and, and doing some physical activities as well. The weather was permitting, so we were able to do that almost every day of the hub. Um, and we were able to really focus on maybe one or two skills. So it was just a short amount of time. We had the speech therapists on site as well. And so, um, you know, unfortunately it was just, like I said, a short period of time, but they were very appreciative and they could see, there were a couple of students who were um, Burkhalter students who after the first week or so really just fought not to leave. They did not wanna leave at the end of the short period of time. So it was very, um, for me as a principal, you know, really good to see that with the proper precautions and such, it could work for um, at least my students on my site, because we had, um, and we had um, kindergarten through fifth grade students. So we had a little slice of everybody there. Uh, Ms. Gathers, if I can add to a slightly different perspective, but a couple of weeks ago, we started athletic conditioning for our athletes across the district in high school. Uh, and, and actually this week, I believe we've actually started some more uh, complex practices. Uh, but I visited a couple of those uh, conditioning sessions and the kids were just overjoyed to be around each other, to have a little socialization, to be out there working out and sweating and, and all that. So yeah, it, it, it seems pretty clear that, that being back together, even doing some hard work uh, is really paying off for these kids. Absolutely. All right, so we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I wanted to see if we have any more questions that we can answer really quickly. Uh, doctors, uh, Ms. Gathers, uh, Ms. Jeanette, anybody, if you see any questions in the Q&A that you can just answer real quick, that would be fantastic. I, I see a quick one. Um, there's a question, are we going to need this vaccine every year? And the answer is hopefully not. <laughs> in general, this type of vaccine is expected to give immunity to a particular version um, for 10 years or maybe even a lifetime. But that said, we need to see um, over time, like we'll need to keep following data. It's possible that we would need more doses. And if the virus variants keep changing, it may be that there's um, different versions of the vaccine that, uh, that are best targeted to the virus in circulation. So the answer is we're not sure yet. Um, and we're gonna learn more in the months to come. And Dr. Frank, what you, what you just mentioned there, that's like the flu vaccine. Every year it's a different flu strain is targeted. Exactly. Right? Each year we prepare for a different version, a different variant of the flu, which is why we get the flu shot annually. With COVID, we're going to have to sort of see how things change over time. And if our original vaccine continues to provide good protection, or if we might need a slightly different version of vaccine. And uh, I'll just ask the two of you, both of you have gotten a vaccine. Uh, I, uh, is it true both of you got Moderna? I got, I work primarily in the emergency department. So um, I, I was able to get the vaccine the third day it was authorized and our hospital only had Pfizer at the time. And, and for both of you, I, I, I've asked this at previous sessions, uh, for anybody who has concerns about the vaccine, uh, don't know whether they should get a vaccine, uh, your feelings about getting the vaccine just kind of from, from personal pr perspective as doctors, but also personally, would you get either one? Would you feel good getting either one? And, and what about Johnson & Johnson as well? In my opinion, the best vaccine is the one that's available to you and gets in your arm as quickly as possible because it's by vaccinate by are not just me as the person, but us as a community getting vaccinated, that we're going to bring the rates of COVID down. This is what we are seeing in smaller countries that have been able to vaccinate their communities faster. COVID is, is becoming much more rare. It's what we're seeing in nursing homes because nursing homes are being prioritized. COVID cases are going away. So 
we cannot have enough of every vaccine. So, and all of the vaccines are so good. All of the vaccines are so effective that the best vaccine is the one that's in my arm. And so, yes, I would take the Johnson & Johnson, the AstraZeneca, the Moderna, the Pfizer. I am pregnant and I chose to get the vaccine while pregnant. I thought hard about it like Dr. Frank did, but in the end, the best vaccine is the one that's in my arm. And so, yes, 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 any one of them, give it to me. <laughs> Um, John, hi, thank you. I want to step in just briefly to name a kind of cluster of questions. I don't know if we'll have time to address them, but there have been a few questions around the testing of children. Um, um, someone thought, oh, are they going to be tested every three days? <laughs> someone in Spanish asked about that. And then there was um, a staff who asked about um, the testing of children as one of the safety measures, testing in general. And then um, there are lots of questions. Uh, there's questions about staff that move across cohorts of students, speech therapists, resource specialists, occupational therapists, that type of itinerant staff that moves. And um, so the challenge is to cohorting there. And maybe if we can't answer those things today, they can be, we can say when and where. Um, and of course, um, there are students with um, disabilities who have special education in the middle and high level. And, um, and I, um, there's a lot of conversation about elementary, but there's a desire to hear about um, support at the middle and high level. Can I say, so I'm gonna take the middle question about students who interact with a lot of different staff, therapists and such layers, right? So if I am a staff that interacts with a lot of students, I'm going to perhaps be more protected with multiple other layers because I recognize that I cannot cohort, okay? So the answer goes back to the layers of protection. A kid will need to see their various therapists, but can we have a schedule that clusters and makes sense based on uh, cohorts, right? So maybe that speech therapist sees kids in a couple of cohorts on a couple of different days so that if there were an exposure, we're still kind of limiting it to the same cohort. I don't know Oakland Unified School plans with regards to middle school and high school, uh, although I do think that cohorting is possible with middle school and high school as well by being mindful of schedules. Um, so I cannot come into the specifics of OUSD's plan. Dr. Frank? Um, I, I work at a middle and high school. All the principles that we've talked about with elementary school apply to middle and high school. Every slice of cheese still applies. Um, I think that it will, um, you know, in, a, in the most ideal situation, we are cohorting. In many high schools, particularly large high schools, that may not be possible. And again, you know, cohorting is, is one slice of cheese. And so if we're able to adhere to most of the others, not cohorting, you know, might be all right. Each of these is a layer of protection. But um, really, all the, all the same um, precautions that we've spoken about for elementary should be um, enacted as much as possible for middle and high school as well. Great. All right. We're, we're uh, running up against time. Uh, I wanted to open it up for Lisa Burnt, though. Um, if you want to just address the emotional issues that we're talking about for uh, these ages, that'd be great uh, to close us out. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. I was thinking about the high school and middle school in particular, just the, you know, the, the motivation to see their friends is strong. And if there's a way to continue to, the, the heroic aspects of keeping their friends safe might be a, something that they could link to. I know it's when they don't, most don't want to do what you tell them to do, but, they, but their friends really depend on them for this. And it's, it's their way to, to really do something um, productive for that. Um, the other thing is just as, as with the younger kids, this tone that we've had tonight that I've heard so clearly from, um, the good doctors is, is, you know, that sort of cheerful optimism and that we're all doing our part here and it's going to be okay with our different slices. So what slices are you using today? It sounds like a really good thing for the younger kids to, to grab onto. Thanks. Great. Okay. We're, uh, we're just a little bit past time now. So I uh, just wanted to wrap things up and, and thank everyone for joining us tonight. We appreciate you being here. Uh, we apologize for not getting to every uh, question that uh, was asked. 
uh, but we appreciate our doctors, we appreciate our nurse, we appreciate our principal, we appreciate uh, our therapist, everybody who's been here to support this effort. Uh, uh, the CAC, thank you for uh, uh, co-hosting this event tonight. Uh, and as we, the district, get more information, of course, we're still gathering information from local, state, and federal officials, from the CDC and all the other sources. Uh, and as we, um, yes, and th thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you to our uh, interpreters uh, and, and especially our ASL. That was great to see. Um, and so uh, thank you all. And, and as we get more information, we will bring it to you. So we will have more sessions like this in the future. So uh, just look out for more information from us. Uh, if you wanna get updated anytime soon, uh, with more detail uh, on anything, look at our website, oesd.org slash reopening 2021. There's tons and tons of information there. Uh, and we will continue to send out messaging to you as well. So thank you all very much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. You guys have a great night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, thank you.